Mini episode 449 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to mini-episode number 449 of the FDH Lounge, the show where nothing is off topic. This is FDH managing partner Rick Morris. We have a wonderful conversation coming up for you today. A real treat if you are a fan of what we like to call the sport of things on this show. Uh, again, we're the show where nothing is off topic, but I have to say that in our coverage over a period of time, it's the subcultures out there uh, that have really probably been the most loyal to this program. And above and beyond any of the other ones, whether we're talking about fantasy sports or politics or some of the premium TV dramas, I would say the most loyal subculture out there has been pro wrestling and uh, we really appreciate how people have uh, responded to and accessed the shows that we have done on that and we've been privileged to have on a number of folks who like today's guests uh, are big in the history of the sport and very involved in that Jim Cornette and J.J. Dillon we have two wrestlers who've been on the show who are listed in the top 50 uh, of that this uh, it's a list that this gentleman put together for a book, The Greatest Professional Wrestlers of All Time. Two of the guys from there, Harley Race and Bret Hart, so we've been pleased to have a little bit of commonality with that. And the nephew of the man who long employed this man, Irv Mushnick, has been a favorite on the show here. So we've really enjoyed these segments, but I've really been looking forward to this conversation in particular once I heard that it was in the works. And I want to thank this guest for shipping out to us. We have a hard copy of the aforementioned book that is uh, the 50 greatest professional wrestlers of all time and a uh, electronic copy of From the Golden Era, the St. Louis Wrestling Record Book, 1959 to 1983. And it is actually that. It is a detailed history of a very, very unique promotion and a very unique time and place in American professional wrestling. We have with us today a gentleman who is uh, among other things, an author, promoter, announcer, and historian on professional wrestling. I speak, of course, of Larry Matisic, and it is our pleasure to bring him to the show today. Larry, welcome to the FDH Lounge. Sir, I've been looking forward to this. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. appreciate you guys having me, and uh, and you named some great names there that, that have been involved in the sport and, and know a lot about the sport over the years. Golly, 1959, that's when wrestling at the Chase started here. I was 12 years Let's see, I just turned 12 years old. The show came on in May and my birthday's in April. So uh, that's when that <laughs> actual part of the era started. But St. Louis Wrestling dates all the way back, as it does in many cities, to way back in the 1920s, and Strangler Lewis and Joe Stecker and people like that, Jimmy Londas in the 30s. And I remember my dad talking to me about going to the arena in 1937 to see Hans Kampfer against Jimmy Londas. So like many of the people that, that follow wrestling, have been involved in wrestling, the string is a long string, and it goes way, way back. It is. It, it definitely is. And it's very much involved, of course, uh, with the history of the town itself culturally. And I'd like to start for a second here with you a little bit off the subject of wrestling. We'll get back to it. This is kind of reminiscent of when we had Dave Meltzer on in the summer of 2011. It was right after the uh, Japanese earthquake. And we're talking to him about his observations of Japanese society and how they were likely to do in terms of rebuilding. I can't talk to you this week without bringing up uh, what's going on in your area, in the greater St. Louis area. It's been a subject wow. of fascination and, I guess, horror, I guess, all across the country at some of the developments there. I don't want to put you on the spot for anything specific, but any thoughts that you have that can kind of give a little bit of background to people as far as the atmosphere of greater St. Louis, whether it be the history of it, whether it be uh, anything more recently, uh, anybody who's on the ground is always able to shed more light on stuff. I know that uh, I'm probably more likely to know more about what's going on with LeBron James and Johnny Mansell than probably anybody <laughs> outside of Cleveland. And on a more serious note, uh, you're, you're, you as somebody in the area and somebody who's been an observer of it over time, I know you mentioned uh, in the St. Louis Wrestling book about some of the touchiness of booking Ernie Ladd and Sweet Daddy Seeky uh, back in the 60s and 70s. So 
what are, what are your thoughts on the, the environment of Greater St. Louis and what's likely to come out of it from this week going forward? Wow. It's a terrible situation. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I doubt anybody will ever have the truth of what happened, but it certainly shows that there has been a long simmering problem in a certain part of, so certainly a certain part of the St. Louis area, Ferguson, which sits oh northeast of the airport. It sits a little north of St. Louis City proper. I'm over in Belleville, Illinois, which is another suburb of St. Louis. I'm about 10 miles southeast of uh, the, the ballpark, for what that's worth. And uh, you feel it across the city. I mean, everybody's a certain amount of tension, a certain amount of shock, I think, at, at just how it erupted so violently. And, and it's, it's, it's just a shame. It, it's horrible. And you'd like to think that you're above that now and that there isn't any prejudice. But, you know, who are we kidding? There's always a certain amount of prejudice that's always going to be there, even though we fight against it. Uh, I can remember talking with Sam Muchnick, the legendary promoter here in St. Louis, when I Let's see, I was in high school in 19... I'd come out of high school, just gotten out of high school, I was in college in 1968, but I was working for Sam. And, of course, that was uh, when Kennedy was, Robert Kennedy was killed, and uh, you had a lot of the riots and, and things going on, a lot of the problems uh, with the Vietnam War and what have you, a pretty wild period. And Sam always felt that one thing that wrestling could serve as some way to kind of calm feelings a little bit, but you really had to be careful. And, and I know, as you said, he was, he was careful about booking, Black wrestlers, very bluntly, especially back in that early part, because St. Louis kind of sits on a, a fault line, the Mason-Dixon line. They used to say it's it's just a tragic situation, and I wish there were easy answers. Uh, there are not easy answers to this, and there never will be easy answers to this. What's even worse is that there's violence within a community. Uh, probably three or four months ago, there's an 11-year-old boy that was killed in his home. He was there with a couple of his brothers and know, he's studying or whatever, and somebody kicked in the window and fired shots in there, and the 11-year-old boy was killed. And the sad part is that there wasn't this type of reaction, at least emotionally, to what happened to that boy. And, you know, that that, that was a sad situation. Until this culture of violence, or, or I hate to get into, I don't want to get into a gun debate or anything like that, but until but or people think the answer is rioting, that's not going to help. The answer is not rioting. The answer is pro. The answer is protesting, certainly, but it's got to be done in a smart way where you get results from it. I don't know if this is going to get results. I don't know if Karen tearing down a QT store is going to get results. It's, 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 it's just a, a very sad case, and, and there's a lot of tension around here. I can imagine. Yes, I mean the uh, the thoughts of uh, this this country are really focused greatly on St. Louis this week, and that's why I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, along the same lines. I know that uh, from uh, reading the uh, the book about St. Louis wrestling from the golden era, the St. Louis wrestling record book, that uh, from reading in there and, and some of the thoughts about wrestling at the chase, which we'll get into a little bit more uh, here subsequently, but is there any kind of a sense that that is a uh, a product that, that sort of brought people together in a way they wouldn't have been otherwise? I know you mentioned in the book that there were anecdotes of uh, people watching Cardinals games at certain places and that the Cardinals have been known to bring people together. I know that in pro wrestling, uh, it's not entirely un unprecedented for that to be the case. And even in areas like Louisiana, uh, which were some of the last ones to come together, I think, racially, I and mean, everybody was brought together by the JYD back in the day. So was there ever a little bit of that in St. Louis of any kind of bonding with wrestling at the chase that you wouldn't have seen maybe from segments of society outside of there? Not only wrestling at the chase, and wrestling at the chase just left such a huge foot footprint on the community. It amazes me to this day. Uh, I've, I've just turned 67 years old, and no matter where I go, I haven't been on TV oh since you know the late 1980s. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews and different things like that, and we did we did some things with the old tapes, so so I got some you know publicity and some mileage there. But I haven't been on TV regularly in all those years. That's 25, almost 30 years. People still remember. And they remember it fondly, and they remember back in the 70s. And they remember, oh, Larry, yeah, yeah, you were doing the announcing. I saw so-and-so, my dad saw this, my uncle saw that. And whenever they talk about it, they've got a smile on their face. And you know what? Black people say it to me, white people say it to me. Uh, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with it. When wrestling works right, just like baseball, just like the sports that you mentioned, when those sports work right, they cut across all the lines of race. They cut across all the lines of politics. They cut across all the lines even of income to a certain extent. And everybody, for that hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours, while they're watching the, 
the, the, the product while they're watching the event. Everybody's the same and they're enjoying it. I mean, that's got to be good to some extent. It can't hurt when you look across the aisle from you and a guy you thought, well, I wouldn't like him because he's white or he's black or he's he's poor or he's, I don't know, he looks like a homeless person or, or he looks like a rich person. And you look across and you're both yelling and cheering for the same thing. I think that takes a... That that makes a difference in society, and and wrestling at the chase, to some extent, was able to do that. It was it was taped originally at the Coruscant Room, the Chase Park Plaza Hotel, rich part of town, Coruscant Room, where they had the uh, Veiled Prophet Parade and ball and all the, all the banquets and the big balls and everything. And here was wrestling, wrestling in, in the Coruscant Room of the Chase Park Plaza Hotel. As Luthez said, what a shock. I'm used to going on the road and going to some little high school gym with a 10-watt bulb. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in the chorus and room, and they have chandeliers up there. I'm wrestling, and I look out into the audience, and there are women in evening gowns to watch this stuff. Uh, it, it just shocked everybody, brought everybody together. It was entertainment. Sure, it's entertainment. But entertainment done right, a concert, a play, it all makes a difference, and it all works. And I don't think anybody can look down at it. And I've thought of that a lot over the years. Is there something I should feel disappointed in myself or sorry about that well you spent your time doing wrestling no nah, there's nothing wrong with that because you can't be serious all the time right now maybe the Cardinals need to go on a big winning streak so and take over first place and it'll help calm things down you never know because when the Cardinals won a World Series and before my back went bad and I was still able to get around I just went around downtown a couple of years ago when everybody people were out in the streets and just happy laughing talking celebrating people you never met before all over downtown St. Louis White, black, rich, poor, and it didn't matter. Everybody was enjoying it. Everybody enjoyed that moment. Boy, if you have a moment you can enjoy, take it. Whether it's wrestling or sports or a concert or what have you, I I don't mean to preach, but it's certainly something you better enjoy when you have it because you don't have it all that often, as what's happening in Ferguson, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri right now kind of proves. Exactly. That kind of brings it full circle there because we, we, we don't have enough of these things these days. And for anybody who... Uh, bemoans uh, what they think is is too much importance in the world given to sports or uh, for anybody who still says that about wrestling, you might tend to hear that from critics during WrestleMania season that, uh, again, we don't have enough of these things to really bring us together anymore. That's a great point. And that even when you get into, say, the music industry, there's there's more narrow casting as far as stations go. And, you know, nobody has to really kind of leave their little silos these days. We don't really have those things as much anymore. Wrestling at the Chase definitely provided that. And, again, as you say, that was unique because it was differentiated from the TV studio wrestling that you would see in other cities. Beyond that, though, the nature of the St. Louis uh, territory, and I want to get into that because it, it, maybe it, it wasn't exactly a territory as it was understood. Uh, I, I always try to remember whenever we're having these discussions here that uh, there may be a great many people out there not as big of a nerd about this as me. So for the people <laughs> who don't really – uh, have as much of an understanding of what we're talking about here. St. Louis, it, it was almost like an all-star kind of a city, was it not? Because prior to when you had Vince McMahon going national with the WWF in 1984 and a, a, a homogenized product of where you could see the same stars in every city, prior to that in the era of the territories, you had one city where you'd be getting uh, kind of like the best of the best from across the NWA coming in, some of the AWA guys, uh, once in a while, the WWF guys coming in and the guys that you would see in the magazines or if you'd been in another city and seen them, that you could see them in St. Louis. It was a unique time and place, it seems like, because there was no other city in the country that existed like that. And you're exactly right. It was a cherry that, that was on top of the uh, ice cream soda, so to speak. Uh, and that's what I thought about saying, listen, sure, it's a certain amount of prejudice, but you look back and just as you said, the facts are there. It was not a territory. We had one town by choice, and that was Sam Mushnick's idea. He was the president of the National Wrestling Alliance back in those days, which was the dominating force. It was a, I guess the, the, they could describe it as a cooperative of wrestling promoters. It was not a dominant force in terms of they shouldn't be forcing their way of doing wrestling down everybody's throat. The only thing they really did as a unit was to pick a world champion, and then each person, each promotion within that within that organization would use that world champion. And there were roughly 25, 26 different individual promotions, individual booking territories that were part of the NWA. And even those that were not part of the NWA, like the AWA, like the WWF for a while, they were in and out, 
they still maintained good relationships with Sam Muchnick, and he was able to keep sometimes a little squabble from evolving into something too horrible. Didn't always work. There was a big battle in Detroit. There was a big battle in Atlanta, Georgia, that ended up going to court and ended up just being nasty situations. But they were resolved, and then do the best you can. But Sam never wanted to have more than one town. He said, I got enough work to do just trying to keep everybody calm here, trying to keep everybody from getting, getting angry at each other. So he was happy to have that one town that was promoted just the way he believed in it. He believed professional wrestling should be promoted like any other sport. He was originally a baseball writer, and you've talked with her much, so you probably have some, some background on Sam. You know exactly what mm-hmm. kind of guy Sam was, his background. And so it was promoted like a sport. That's how I grew up thinking of wrestling because I was here, even though I was trading wrestling results with people all over the country, riding and doing the things that Dave Meltzer did. And sometimes, I raised, amazingly enough, Dave Meltzer actually traded results with some of the same people in different generations because Dave's younger than I am. But uh, it's, it's amazing how some of the same names popped up, like Diane Devine and different people like that that we were trading results with. Bottom line was St. Louis existed by itself. Muchnick was powerful because of the NWA. People wanted to have him on their side, his good nature. When there had been a legal battle, a legal challenge to the NWA, that it was a part of a monopoly, Sam, through his connections in the government, especially through a House of Representative man, Melvin Price, who was, House of Rep- who was a representative from actually the area where I lived in Belleville, Illinois, who was a very powerful man. They were able to work some sort of consent decree with the government that kept professional wrestling from being broken up and because he showed the power that he showed in that area and then because of the incredible success the absolutely incredible success of wrestling at the chase it kind of put sam really in a position of power where nobody wanted to mess with the old man and that was okay he didn't want to mess with them his feeling always was promote your town the way you think is best for you you live there promote it your way have your guys but I want to be able to book some of the best people here, some of the best people there, and that's what we did. And it was, it was just an amazing time in St. Louis where you said we'd have all these different names coming in at main events and challenging for the NWA title. Uh, and the business being treated with respect by the local media, a lot of that was Sam. And as I grew up and became part of the business, I was able to follow in his footsteps going to Cardinal baseball games, having hockey tickets with the Blues, going to uh, the, the local repertory theater, uh, eating dinner at Norwood Hills Country Club, different things like that. You were part of the community. You you weren't an outcast. You were something that they could respect, uh, taking part in the St. Louis, Elk St. Louis Sports Celebrity Dinner, things like that. How many major sports dinners with their major award ever gave it to a wrestling promoter? St. Louis, they did. They gave the Bruce Campbell Award to Sam Muchnick. Amazing, because people who got that award were people like Jack Buck and August Bush, who owned the Cardinals, and, and people like that. That's who got that award, and Sam Muchnick got that award. That's how much the St. Louis area thought of the promoter of professional wrestling. And it's really how much they thought of wrestling. Ted DiBiase said it once, too. You'd come into the town, and you could feel the difference, how people responded to wrestlers. There was a real respect, like, hey, he's, he's, like, he's like the third baseman for the Cardinals. Something special. And the matches had substance. They all meant something. That was Sam's psychology. Winning, losing mattered. It mattered how. It mattered when. Going for the title made a difference. If you lost, it wasn't the end of the world. It just meant Cardinals play the Cubs 18 times a year. Somebody's going to win 10. Somebody's going to win 8. Somebody's going to lose 8. Somebody's going to lose 10. It doesn't mean one's worse than the other. It just means the other guy's got to bounce back and fight back. He was able to establish this whole psychology of how you promote wrestling, how you book wrestling, and it just made it different in St. Louis. And I think if you talk to some of the people who made it through that era, they'd realize, they'd tell you, it was just different. Talk to Dory Funk, talk to Terry Funk, talk to DiBiase, talk to Harley Race. They know, right time, right place, right people. And, and Sam was able to keep it that way really until... Oh, right around 1980 when it started all breaking apart, and that's really when he was nearing retirement. So, And then his wife died in 1981, and he retired, of course, as promoter January 1st, 1982. And by then the NWA was on the way down. Vince McMahon sensed it. The world was changing because of television. You had the opportunity where one entity could control everything because they could control TV, and that's what happened. The world changed. 
Vince McMahon was the right guy at the right time in the right place for his time. Just as Sam Mushnick had been the right guy in the same situation for his work in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Well, as far as the heyday goes in St. Louis, uh, this book from the Golden Era it does a great job, of course, of capturing that. And, and I have to say that in, in reading the book, uh, there was a major wrestler of the 1960s in St. Louis that I'd never even heard of before, John Paul Hennig. It was interesting yeah. to trace him through the results going through a period of time. Even a big nerd like me had never heard of the guy uh, prior to that. But, yeah, St. Louis had that kind of uh, glory to it. And, of course, you know, with, with the uh, your, some of your predecessors as announcers in St. Louis, there, Joe Garagiola, Joe Buck, both spending some time on the mic. That had a lot to do with it, certainly, as well. I wonder, in flashing back to our previous conversation with Dave Meltzer, I wonder if there's any kind of a comparison uh, to Japan there. I remember uh, joking with him about uh, on The Simpsons the one time Homer said, uh, pro wrestling in Japan, it's real over there, Lisa. But, you know, <laughs> that's the kind of, that's the, that's the image that we have, uh, is it not? That uh, Dave said on the program, he said, whether it still is or not, it has been for a long time a mainstream part of society. People in America don't realize that it's a mainstream part of society. And in St. Louis, it sounds like, again, it wasn't marginalized the way it was in so many other wrestling cities. It was actually in the mainstream. It's funny when you say that because that was, that was a comment I'd hear often as I did the ring announcing eventually in addition to doing the play-by-play for wrestling at the Chase. So I'd be leaving Keele Auditorium, which was the famous building where most of the matches were held, once in a while, the arena, but primarily Keele Auditorium. I hear that talk, oh, you know, those preliminaries, those, those aren't real. But those main events, that's real. I mean, when they go for the title, that's real. <laughs> they, they, And, you know, that's fine that they, they feel that way. And it was easier to do back then before Vince let, the, uh, let, the, uh, let all the uh, secrets out of the bag. Shame on him, but he had his own reasons for doing it, which is, of course, to avoid taxes. He didn't want to be taxed as an athletic body. Now... Because he wants to have a different, a different, uh, different outlook on how he is judged by the television community. He wants to be a sport again because sports have better, better ratings mm-hmm. and have better prices for their commercials. That's now he wants to be a sport again, so he doesn't want to really be entertainment. He wants to be a sport. Nonetheless, yeah, Sam had that ability to make this part of it is special. This part of it's real. And, uh, again, even now I work with a little independent promotion here in, in Belleville, a Southern Illinois Championship Wrestling. Typical independent promotion. A lot of young guys who are going to go nowhere. Some old guys who came pretty close. And they just still love it and they still do it. And we've been able to, to kind of catch capture that flavor just a little bit. And I always tell the guys, hey, if you can just make them believe in you, buy into you for 30 seconds, 20 seconds when you're out there, that's great because then they're going to cheer and when you're going to you're going to know if they've done it if you get that pop from the audience that's when you can tell because so many independent cards I think people in whether it's Cleveland or, or the Northeast or the Southwest they'd say the same thing so many of the independent cards people leave halfway through the thing because well I saw my neighbor wrestle I saw my cousin wrestle I'm done I saw the guy I wanted to wrestle leave and they don't care about the main event or what's going on at all we've been able to at least on SICW knock on wood so far. They stay for our main event because we've been able to make it look like something special. And really all I'm doing is so-called old-school booking that I learned from Sam Mushnick. It still works. You know what? It's just like football. A touchdown still gets six points plus the extra point. A home run in baseball still is exciting to watch. It's still a moment to see. When you hit that long basket with the, with the game on the line, that's exciting. And we've been able to do that in wrestling to a certain extent. Well, you can have all the the uh, commitment to uh, basics in the world, and, and, and clearly you guys did there in St. Louis, but there's always going to be more to it than that. And you look at, of course, just down the road from there on the other end of the state, Kansas City. And I'm curious about uh, your, your thoughts on that because, again, they ended up furnishing some of the uh, undercard and midcard wrestlers to St. Louis over a period of time. But Kansas City was always renowned as a, a very weak center of a wrestling territory, certainly nothing on par with Memphis or Dallas or Atlanta or other areas like that. Was it an area of where it, it, uh, there, there just wasn't enough of a wrestling following there to, to be able to prop it up? Uh, was, was it the stable of wrestlers there? What were some of the factors that accounted for Kansas City being uh, really kind of a weak sister to St. Louis in that regard? 
Well, probably a little bit of all that at different times. It, it had the reputation within the business, too, of being a learning territory where a lot of young guys would go to uh, get some salt on themselves to find out how this business worked, to get on the road to work six, seven nights a week. It wrestled in a lot. They had a lot of smaller towns in which they worked, and, of course, that was part of it, too. And the payoffs weren't necessarily all that great. But uh, I think if you talk to somebody from Kansas City, they, they tell me, they tell you, they go, what is he talking about? It was great here because they remember something else as a kid growing up. But, no, they had a, a smaller, just a smaller uh, venue to work with, smaller areas to work with. And that's the way it had always been. I think it's just the way they learned to promote wrestling in that area. And they were satisfied with that. And they could make money that way. So they were making money. So let's not, let's not take a knock at them. It was a profitable promotion. They made money for a lot of years. And, and they worked darn hard at it. Now, I went and did some TV for them relatively early when I was doing the TV in St. Louis back in the early 70s. And it was a different feel to the whole thing. Uh, not something I wanted to do on a regular basis and really couldn't do because of the timing of their major shows on a Thursday night and our major shows would be Friday night. And since I was involved in the office here so much, I really needed to be in St. Louis. But Sam wanted me to go a couple times. And when I got back the one time, he said, do you see the difference? Because you've never been out on the road. Now you get a chance to go out and see the difference. Do you see the difference? And yeah, I did. I don't know that it's so easy to articulate exactly what that difference is but it was a lot of those different things. I think more than anything, though, was smaller towns. And they didn't run the big building in their own town, which was the Kansas City, uh, I think it was the municipal, was the municipal Auditorium on the Kansas City, Missouri side. It was about 10,000-seat building the size of Keele Auditorium. And Sam always would, would kind of bemoan the fact that they didn't try to run it, that they didn't work on doing this thing. But they had grown up, the people who ran that show, Bob Geigel, Pat O'Connor, uh, Harley Race, and they had grown up with Gus Karras, and he ran weekly wrestling in a smaller building. It's that simple. Where Sam ran 17 times a year, once every two, three weeks, in a big building that drew 10,000 people. So our goal was to draw six, seven, eight thousand, maybe 10,000 people every three weeks. Their goal was to draw, I don't know, 800,000 people every week. Different goals, different ways to work it. But again, they made money. So you have to give them credit, and, and it was not a territory that was necessarily rushed to to be in unless you were a young wrestler, because if you did go there as a young wrestler, you would meet a lot of guys on their way up, on their way down, but people you could learn from, and you'd work six, seven nights a week, different towns, different crowds, different opponents, something that's totally lost in wrestling now today and hurts the product in the ring without question because you have the same people when they work, they work against each other, so nobody really has to learn anything. Nobody has to become versatile. Well, in the days of the territories, Kansas City being one of them, Memphis being one, some of the ones that didn't do so well financially, didn't pay the guys so well, they could learn how to work there, and they would make them. They would learn their craft. They would sharpen up the way they worked. I mean, here came Harley Race out of Kansas City, and certainly nobody could ever, ever, ever take a knock at Harley for the way he worked. I mean, what a great performer, and he came out of, out of Kansas City. But, of course, sometimes uh, part of it is just natural skill, too, you know. Some of, some of us have that gift, and Harley was among those who had the gift, who knew what to do when he got in that ring. He certainly did. And you talk about uh, Kansas City uh, managing to draw money on the scale that they did, and he was, of course, a huge part of that, no question about it. Uh, definitely want to ask you about the Top 50 book, but as well, there, there's another one that I want to ask about. That, that is out there, uh, Brody, The Triumph and Tragedy of Wrestling's Rebel, which uh, had come out uh, some years ago. Definitely want to ask you about that. Uh, I know it would be of interest to the listeners to this show, uh, of course, you being uh, great uh, friends with Bruiser Brody. Uh, again, your collaborator on that book is Widow Barbara and his son. I think our, our listeners would be uh, interested to hear how they're doing these days. They're doing fine. Uh, Barbara's in Florida. She lives in Florida now. And uh, just went through an abdominal surgery, so uh, she, she hasn't exactly been out dancing right now. But uh, she, overall, she's doing well. Jeffrey, his son, is in Austin, Texas, and uh, I believe he's working with a restaurant. He's very much involved in the restaurant business and uh, and doing well there. Uh, Brody was a great friend. Uh, when wrestling fell apart in 1983 here in St. Louis, uh, and again, no knock at the people. We all come from different backgrounds in there in Kansas City was originally a minority partner in the St. Louis Wrestling Club for the logical fact, as you said, they could provide talent relatively close, cheaply because it was not a long transportation ride, 
and it would be great for a second, third match guys. And Sam Oss wanted them as, as a minority partner. Well, they were among those who bought Sam out, but they all had a different idea how to run St. Louis. Long story short, I had one idea, they had the other idea, and we fell apart. I ended up working on my own, starting my own promotion. And Brody was a key guy in that promotion. Uh, it really didn't much matter what either, any of us did because after about six months, Vince McMahon came along and took over everything and just wiped out everybody. So, moot point. Bottom line is that uh, Brody, during that period, became a great friend of mine. And while I was working for Vince McMahon, and I spent over a decade working with Vince McMahon at the WWF at that time. Uh, Brody and I helped run independent cards here. Uh, really, Brody working independent cards was probably, as we look back at the history of wrestling, one of the key moments in making independent wrestling worthwhile. Because as he did that, then other guys started to do the same thing and found out they could make money doing it. Wow, that's amazing. So all of a sudden, uh, independent wrestling became a viable alternative. If you also had Japan, of course, it helped. Brody had that. So he's a, he was a very good friend, knew a lot about the business. A lot of the things that we talked about in those late-night rides when, we, when he'd be in town and we'd be working in, I don't know, Watsika, Illinois, uh, Centralia, Illinois, great little town for us, and different places like that with promoter Herb Simmons using his license and uh, somebody I still work with and a good friend, Herb Simmons. Anyhow... Uh, some of the things that Brody and I talked about, and Brody would say, whoever owns the TV is going to make professional wrestling whatever professional wrestling is. Because when kids come along, they won't know about what happened. They won't know about Sam Muchnick. They're not going to know about Brody against Flair. They're not going to know about uh, the Funks against the race. And they're not going to know about any of those matches. All they're going to know is what they see on TV. So first of all, you got to control TV. Well, what did Vince McMahon do? He controlled TV, didn't he? It's what he's doing today. Even though TNA may be on for a little while, ROH has some work with Sinclair Broadcasting. It's a drop in the bucket compared to what Vince does. And as long as he controls TV, he controls what wrestling is. So he's able to sell that product to a new audience, get a new audience every year. Maybe they don't stay. Maybe they lose interest in it after a while. And that was one of the great things of the old St. Louis style was that you didn't have that turnover of, I got interested in it when I was 14 years old, and then by the time I got into high school, I kind of lost interest in it because it was done intelligently. We kept them all for a long time, where now you kind of have a lot of that turnover. You don't have necessarily all the people staying. I've been a fan since I was 16 years old. I was a fan when I was 26, and I'm 46 now, and I'm a fan today. You don't have quite as much of that. But uh, throughout that whole period, it's something that Brody kind of picked up on and different things he'd say. uh, Yeah, kind of amazing. Yet he had this reputation as a rebel. He didn't put up with any baloney from any promoter. Uh, He could make life miserable for most promoters. The promoters that he didn't make life miserable for were the ones he respected because, as he said, I gave them my word, they gave me their word, and nobody ever broke either one. That was Sam Muchnick, Fritz von Erich, Giant Bab Baba in Japan. And uh, those were the ones that he never had a problem with. And the promoters that he did have problems with, even though he'd say, ah, I'm mad at him, I'm never going to use him again, because he drew so much money for him, because he is such a great drawing card, they'd ask him back anyway, because in the end, they wanted to draw money, and Brody was the guy who drew money, and they just have to swallow, and he'd say, hey, last time I was there, you know, you kind of messed me up on that payoff in those main events. This time I want X amount up front when I come in the door. And if I don't get it, I turn around and I leave. And so they'd have to swallow and pay him. That never happened with Sam Mushnick or anything like that. I mean, it was an honest payoff, and, and Brody realized it. So he he was a rebel in that in that way, but not a rebel. And uh, what happened to him in Puerto Rico, where he was murdered by Jose Gonzalez, and, and the whole trial that we talk about in the book was a horrible situation. Uh, Barbara was uh, amazing in talking about life with a wrestler and how they met and what happened. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very happy with that book. I'm happy that Barbara got to talk about it. And she was very hesitant to write with me at first. And Michael Holmes, the ECW editor we had, ECW Press in Toronto, Canada, he helped convince her, and we both said the same thing. There are so many lies out there about Bruiser Brody. There is so much baloney out there about he did this or he did that, he's a horrible this or he's a horrible person for that. They're all lies. The only way anybody's ever going to hear the truth is if you tell it, Barbara. 
So do this together. We'll write it exactly as we know it. We won't pull any punches. We'll talk about some of the things you did where you did double-cross promoters for good reason quite often. And we'll talk about some of those situations, maybe where he did punch somebody out because he was a tough guy. But we'll also talk about the good stuff, and we'll make it a real look at a human being who was something special in a very bizarre business like professional wrestling. So uh, Barbara did a fabulous job because once she got into it, she really was able to open up and uh, it just made the book something special, I think. And it's still, amazingly enough, that that, that thing's still being, Rick, it's still being, I get I get royalties from it every year, Barbara and I do. So I guess that was 2007 that came out. So we're talking seven years, the darn thing still sells pretty well. Excellent. Yeah, it really deserves to. And uh, I'm sure that's one of the reasons that, again, there's some other things also that uh, Bruiser couldn't have foreseen when he was talking about uh, the past being forgotten uh, in terms of tape trading, DVDs, YouTube, etc. But uh, Bruiser Brody uh, certainly is known to this generation uh, probably way more than he could have ever anticipated uh, because of uh, people rediscovering everything that he did and the hunger for it. And Again, there's that natural hunger that people have for history and learning about things uh, in terms of that book, Brody, The Triumph and the Tragedy of Wrestling's Rebel, as well as the 50 Greatest Professional Wrestlers of All Time, The Definitive Shoot, which uh, I found to be very, very interesting. And I have to say, in going through it, it, it I, I could kind of empathize with you a little bit on putting together this list because we did one on our blog a couple of years ago, but just in terms of the criteria of drawing money. And, of course, on that one, Hulk Hogan ended up being number one. If we were going on aesthetics, I'm not sure he would have been in our top 100. But uh, <laughs> the other thing was... It's interesting to me what you were doing here. You know, like clearly you were taking into account money drawing because Hulk Hogan was number four on here, but you were clearly working into it work rate and aesthetics. You were working into it uh, longevity. And I don't know that I could get an exact handle on what your formula was as I was reading it, which really made it interesting. So to the extent that you can, and I know a lot of this is probably just intuitive feel, but uh, what was your kind of process for slotting guys against one another and determining uh, – uh, who would go above somebody else? Oh, in some cases, it was almost impossible. I mean, realistically, I figure you could take a blanket and you could throw it at everybody from number 10 to number 30. They're all the same, you know, whoever you put in front. And I guess my point in the book was, and you say you're right, it was, it was just intuitive. It was just feelings. Uh, at a certain point, there's so much that are, they're so even. How, how do you take them apart? How do you put a, a Strangler Lewis versus a, a Ric Flair I mean, look what they did each did in their generation. How do you put uh, Steve Austin against, uh, uh, I don't know, Dick the Bruiser? They were different periods of time. How do you put Luthez, who I put number one, because he lasted the longest. He was 37 years on top as a main event performer, and he went through a couple of different changes in the style of the business. How many guys have done that? It was difficult. But my point more was, as you make a top 50, I don't expect every. I didn't expect everybody. I don't expect everybody to agree with my top fifty. Of course not. Nobody's going to have the same top fifty. Nobody can ever make it just perfect. Nobody knows. So what the question becomes is, can you do it with some sort of intelligence? Can you do it with respect for the other guy? Can you have respect for why I said what I said? And can I have respect for what you said? What you said? And if we can do that, that's the main thing. And and even there, and that's why I had one of the chapters in there about what about, I think I titled it, What About? There are so many guys after the top 50 that I have after my top 50 that probably should have been top 50. I mean, it's almost impossible to say, how could you not put him in the top 50? And then again, you're, here you are looking at how many wrestlers do you think there were from 1900 to 2012? Think of the numbers of guys there were. Now you're going to narrow it down to just 50. So just to be even thought about it was, was a, you know, I thought an honor, and uh, and and I I really really struggled with some of the places. How do you put them? Especially modern guys too. How did you put them in there? And at the time, a lot of people were saying you got to put CM Punk in. You got to put CM Punk in. Man, look how great he's doing. He's going to be great forever. Well, then you know what he did? He quit. So and how can you yeah. put him in the top 50? And he walked out. Oh, wait a minute, he's not in the top 50, he didn't stay long enough. He had he was on top for, what, three years, two, three years, had a hot run, he quit. More power to him. He had the money he wanted, he had the satisfaction that he needed, and he quit. He wasn't top 50. And then they say, well, how could you put Brock Lesnar in? Well, my argument on Lesnar would be, look what he did. NCAA champion, UFC champion, WWE champion. 
whether that's a real championship or not's beside the point. He was thought of well enough that he was given the top prize in that particular business. So how, how many other people did that? And so I thought he belonged in there for that reason. Uh, I can understand the arguments against him. I can understand the arguments either way. And I, I was surprised myself when I got to certain positions there. I didn't have people in it in my first as I first went through it. And then as time went through and I kind of look at this guy and I pick and peck away at him and say, well, yeah, but, you know, he didn't draw very much here. He, he, he wasn't in main events here. Uh, he wasn't this. He wasn't that. And then I find other guys like a big Bill Miller who was main event everywhere who was a tremendous performer, who was an NCAA champion, in addition to being a main event wrestling performer, and became a doctor, a veterinarian, certainly different. And all of a sudden I had Big Bill Miller in my top 50, and when I first started out, I didn't think I'd have him in my top 75. And all of a sudden, wow, you know, I think he does belong there. So don't take what I'm saying as a be-all, end-all, this is the way it has to be. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is a most entertaining way to spend an evening or a week, picking out who you think the top 50 are. Here's one idea for you. Take a look at it. See what you think. And, of course, it isn't, I, I think it, I would like to think it's better than Vince McMahon's idea of the top 50 because <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't put Luthez behind Jerry Lawler, and we won't even get into how some of those, those choices that you just kind of shake your head at. Of course, part of it depended upon if you worked for WWE, and once again, I may not agree with how I picked it, but I realize he picked it just like he picks people for the Hall of Fame. It's a marketing ploy. If he can say he's a top 50 Hall of Fame performer, and I own the rights to his DVDs, you can get his DVDs from me right here, Vince McMahon. Buy them. Make me a profit. Help run my stock up. Well, that's that's a little bit different, too. And I didn't want to pick somebody for that reason. That's certainly not a reason to pick him. And uh, I'd say take it for what it is. That probably in the course of the book, and I think you probably agree with it, I bet I talk about 200 different wrestlers easily within that book. And I say some pros and some cons about them. And if you feel differently about it, I'm not mad. I mean, this is, you know, Let's talk about the best uh, basketball players in the world. Was LeBron? Who's better, LeBron James or Michael Jordan? What are you going to base that on? Well, wait a minute. What about Alcindor? What about, what about Javar? You know? And we can, we can go into that. We can go into football. We can go into baseball. We can do all that stuff. It's fun. It's entertainment. And you know, while we're having that discussion, we're talking about wrestling, and we're talking about baseball, and we're talking about hockey, and we're talking about football, and we're not talking about Ferguson, and we're not talking about Ferguson, Missouri, we're not talking about some of these things that they need to be talked about, but you can't talk about them all the time. You've got to have a moment where you just kind of ah, take a deep breath and enjoy, enjoy what you're doing for a moment. So it has a purpose, and we'll argue about uh, who should be where in the top 50 and argue in gentlemanly fashion, hopefully. Well, the world really needs, as you said, these kind of diversions to uh, to entertain us uh, in these uh, very stressful times. And uh, news-wise, uh, one of the most stressful summers all the way around, not just Ferguson, Missouri, but uh, it seems like the entire world was on fire this summer. So it's a, oh, wow. it's a wonderful time for diversions such as this. So the 50 greatest professional wrestlers of all time, uh, from the golden era, the St. Louis Wrestling Record Book, 1959 to 1983, uh, both, uh, of course, penned by you as well as the Brody Book, uh, Larry Matisic. A pleasure to have you on the program, as I knew it would be uh, an outstanding uh, conversation. Uh, please don't be a stranger, sir. Love to have you back on and be uh, conversing with you about the sport of kings again. Anytime. It's, it's fun. I mean, you obviously, you've done, as uh, Lou says would say, you've done your homework, you've, worked, you've burned the midnight oil, you're you're actually as crazy about this thing as we are, so I kind of <laughs> enjoy that. It's fun to talk with somebody and and with people who enjoy the same thing you do, and and I don't think that'll ever go away. I think I appreciate it more now than I ever have in my entire life because I realize now what fun it is to talk about it, and that doesn't mean we ignore the serious stuff. We'll deal with that, but we can deal with that in its time and place. And once in a while, we can take a break and look at these other things too. You, you came up with some great points there very much, Rick, and I, I enjoyed being with you. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Larry. I definitely look forward to doing it again. And, again, thank you all, everybody, today for tuning in to mini-episode number 449 of the FDH Lounge. 
we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IAmBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, the Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 